Lucinda Russell team has become one of the most upwardly mobile outfits in national hunt racing these days. Based outside Kinross near Edinburgh, the outfit has won no less than two Grand Ox Grand Nationals in the past six years. One for Arthur in 2017 and of course Corrick Rambler back in April of this year. And we've come along to find out more about the aspirations of the team for the season ahead. Great to be here, wonderful atmosphere. You've, you've got a big team of staff and a much bigger team of horses, probably the biggest team you've had. Yeah, it's funny, I said to Sue the other day, are these the best days of our life? And I think they probably are. I mean, they, because I think when he was riding, he was wound up. And when we first started training, we were anxious about what, whether we we're doing things right. And I think the one thing that you get when you win a couple of nationals is you get a confidence. And, um, I love it. You know, the atmosphere, as you say, the atmosphere just now is fantastic. The people that work for me are just great. And we've got some lovely horses to look forward to. With great success, I guess, comes great responsibility. And, you know, from the time you won the, the first, your first national with one for Arthur, did you, did you feel pretty much all the eyes of the world were on you and you were going to get interviewed a lot more by, say, the mainstream media, for instance? Um, I don't think I've really preempted that. Um, it was, I think I've learned how to. Uh, deal with the sort of the, the mainstream media because everyone if we're going to go down the way that the racing is um, looked at by the media we have to be very careful we're very lucky in our own little world and it's great and we know what we do and we, and we just talk about different horses and different names different personalities but I think we have to be very aware of our image within the, the big world and um, Look, I'm lucky I'm a girl, so I can, I've got a different view of things and I can, I can come at it from a different angle. Um, and I've, I've probably learned, Skew's very good at it. You know, he was, um, obviously he was into journalism a bit when he left, first left racing and it's, uh, he's taught me how to, how to deal with it. But I, it doesn't stress me, it doesn't wind me up. I mean, it only stresses me because in the time that I'm speaking to you, I could be sitting with a horse and, and, and riding a horse or, or dealing with a horse, but um, presenting our sport to the wider, world we have to do it. it's our responsibility you were on desert island discs recently um i mean that is as mainstream and as high profile as it gets did did you enjoy it absolutely loved it it was it's funny i'm not sure i, th I think um desert island discs is such a it's a thing from our past it's been going for so many years and it's uh it's quite an institution so it's quite an honor to be asked to do it i did think when i first got the email that someone was taking the mickey I didn't, think, I didn't think it was real that anyone actually wanted to know what eight songs I liked. But um, it was good fun to do. I, you know, it's a good education to look up the songs that you enjoy and, and uh, why you like them. Um, going down to the BBC was great. I really enjoyed going to the broadcasting house. That was good. But, um, uh, yeah, it is an honour. It it's one of those things. You know, I think um, when I won the National 2017 with one for Arthur, after that I was awarded an OBE, and that was phenomenal. This time, having won it with... Correct Rambler. I've had some really odd things, really vague things. So that was Desert Island Discs, a great thing. I was awarded the Freedom of Perth. That was fantastic. Um, and it is funny how suddenly you feel sort of uh, taken into the whole world. It's not just about, as I say, our little racing bubble. It's, it's about the, the greater good. If you were to look back on your career so far, who was the most important horse you've trained? Who, who was the one horse who made you feel yeah, I can do this, I'm, I'm a racehorse trainer. Well, I guess I'd, I'd love to say Fively Bills because he was my first runner, first winner, that was great. But probably Brindisi Breeze. So when he won at Cheltenham, I think everything, so bear in mind I'm not from a racing background, so everything that I've done is, I'm sort of fresh to it. And uh, I was quite amazed about winning a grade one at Cheltenham. People said to me, you've won a grade one at Cheltenham, this is really important. I didn't quite get it to start with, now I get it. Um, and. So that was probably the horse that made me realise how important good races are. Winning races is really important, but winning good races is even more so. And of course, you've got such a, a vibrant racing scene up here, up, up north. You've got four or five race courses in Scotland and, and a few more over the border as well. But yeah, I would imagine it must have been quite a thrill when you went down south with, with Brindisi and pretty much made the running and, and, and showed all the southerners the, the way home in, in, in an Albert Bartlett. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was fantastic because, of course, we, we tend to use our own jockeys. Campbell Gillis, who rode him as a young boy, was absolutely on the upgrade. Uh, as you say, front running is, is fantastic. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a great joy. But it, it, it's very similar to what we do now. You know, we're a very small team. We're very um, 
close knit. I like using our own jockeys. I like knowing that the jockeys that ride for us know the horses, that they know the way that we want things done. And it, it gives you an even greater pride. Of course, we're proud for the owner and for the horse and for ourselves, but we aren't. We're proud for everyone that works so hard here at, at Ardery and Kinross. Lucinda's partner, Peter Scudamore, former multiple champion jockey, is a really integral part of the team here at Alari House and of course is synonymous with Corrick Rambler, the Randolph's Grand National winner. How many jockeys championships did you have, Peter, on your dance card? Uh, seven year? and a half. I drew one with a chap called Frankham, which is probably my proudest moment. So if I could draw one with him, oh, it can't have been that bad. Now, who was the sportsman there? Because I know one of you pulled up to allow the other he, to... Uh, he was the sportsman. I was never a sportsman. He, I, was, I was hurt and he, I think he had 20 winners to ride. And he uh, said to me, or he said to my dad, actually, um, if I get close, if I get to his total, don't worry, I'll, I'll stop. And he said he thought that was because I'd never be champion jockey again. That was the only one chance I got. So, <laughs> really? And did you did you believe him at the time? I mean, did it come as a big surprise to you? You know, that sort of it's it's a rare form of sportsmanship. Uh, it's really. an unbelievable form of sportsmanship. It's funny enough, I you know there would always be a nagging doubt, wasn't there? But I mean, when John says something, he, he sticks by his words. So um, it was quite a, a surreal experience in in, in, in some ways, but. Uh, you know, even in those days, um, he was held in great regard and, um, yeah, I pretty much believed him, yeah. A talented trainer in his own right, Michael Scudamore has recently joined the team here at Alari House to help the operation as its number of horses continues to expand. Of course, there's parts of Hereford you miss. It's, it's a lovely county and, uh, yeah, grew up there and got a lot of friends and, and people are very good to us there. So. Of course you missed that side but to come here and be part of this project is uh, is very exciting what what was sort of the big idea you you moving up north and your brother tom is is down south and where you were in, in Ecclesweld. so how does the whole russell scudamore <laughs> system work these days um well it, it sort of all came about really after it's something we've spoken about for, for a lot of years that one day we'd like to try and bring it all under one umbrella but not really ever knowing how the best way to do that was um but it was then after the national and the success of Apples Away and one or two others, it was kind of a case of, well, look, we're going to get pretty big up here now, and, and how do we manage that best and, and have the right personnel in place? Um, and it just coincided with Tom retiring, um, and therefore, so all the sort of pieces seemed to, to fall in together that it just made sense to, to come up here and, and help as, as this place is expanding, and, and Tom could move into to, to where I was and um, sort of help the pre-training and, and have a lot of the youngsters down there. How much of a difference has Michael made since moving up from, from Hereford? Oh, I can't tell you. He's extended my life by about, by about 15 years. He's, he's just great. He's very laid back, uh, very reliable, um, helps us. He just helps us. He takes the strain off us. Um, it's another person making a decision. Um, he knows his horses. He's very good with the owners. He's brilliant with the other members of staff. He's, he's just great. I can't, can't praise him high enough. Um, I'm delighted that he's here sharing in the success. And, and you know, with with Tom moving up to Ecclesworth, I think uh, I think we've got a really good, good sort of a, a good way to expand. Two Grand National wins in six years: Ahoy Sonor, Cork Rambler, Apples Way, and a few other nice horses. How important have they been in in terms of taking you guys from a, a medium-sized operation to a a very you know a, a pretty a much bigger organisation? Yeah, oh, massively, because you know everybody wants those big winners. That, you know, they're the ones that put you on the map and, and, and really make a, make a difference, aren't they? And, and like I say, that was sort of the sole, or, or one of the reasons to, to come up is I think after the successes before of the likes of Brindisi Breeze, um, the place grew and I think they felt that they've maybe lost control a little bit just because of you know, time constraints and things. And therefore, if they were going to get big again, the right people had to be in place. And, and that's sort of how we've worked it out. But like I say we're very fortunate to have such nice horses and... Um, like I say, it's just, just a really exciting project to be part of. I look at all the families, I look at John Joe, uh, Junior riding winners for his father at the weekend, and then I look at Willie and uh, all the family he has around him, Gary Moore, and who I rode with. and Nigel and Sam. Nigel and, and Sam. So I, I've had probably more enjoyment this season from the racing than I ever have having Michael here and Thomas on the phone. So, um, yeah, no, it... It is, we, we are immensely privileged, all as families, 
to to be in it but if you want to kick a football you have to kick a football from age four for thousands of times a year if you want to ride a horse you have to be brought up in the back of you know there are exceptions but uh, i think that families coming through through time and time again and again is because uh, that talent is nurtured um, by riding horses all the time you know dad and lucinda have purchased brilliantly well not spending crazy money to do it and um yeah, like it's for whatever reason, those seem to horses really fit well in, into the structure and the system we have here, and hopefully he'll be another one. Among the owners you have, you've got plenty of syndicates. I mean, the, the Golf Widows was probably, the six years ago, they were the most prolific, but you've got plenty of partnership. You've got the partnership as well with, with Corrick Rambler. Yeah, again, Lucinda, and with the help of a few others, Nick Crofts, who's in charge of a lot of those, um, they're, they're brilliant at getting those syndicates together and making feel everyone part of, of it. and. Um, and again, it, it's been a great way of introducing people and, and getting people into racing for not a lot of money. Like I said, you know, Cart Ramble, I think, was 17,000 or something, you know. So, you know, with a syndicate, that's an affordable figure, you know. And um, like I say, you know, she, she's done very, very well with the syndicates and, and hopefully that'll continue. How do you guys measure success? Is it just number of winners or is it number of big races won? And the amount of nice horses coming through for the future as well, or a combination of all of it? I think, yeah, you fit the nail on the head. It's, it's a combination of everything. Of course, you, you know, you want those big Saturday winners, but they don't come without the, the numbers we and they don't really come do. without the, everything else. So it all fits into place. And, um, yeah, look, I, I, I'd be lying if I said, look, we didn't sit down and have our, our weekly meetings and, you know, we really want to try and be as dominant a dominant force as we can be up, up in the north. And, the more we can do that, the more chance then we've got of, of spreading down south and, and hopefully continuing that down there if, if possible. You know? But of course, up here, up north, I mean, you've got five race courses in Scotland alone. It's, it's a vibrant racing scene in its own right, up north, as, as, as we call it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and everybody, you know, since I've moved up and, and even with our travels when I was down south, everyone is so friendly up here and, and looks after you so well and so accommodating. And um, like I say, there's a real real great scene of, of, of racing up here that just seems to be going from strength to strength you know, all, you know lots of other yards doing very well up here and uh, you know like i said it's, it's a real vibrant scene you've gotten deservedly so as well you've gotten quite a few extra owners syndicates and, and racing partnerships they've always been a, a big part of your operation Yes, I mean, to start with, I suppose um, my father probably owned quite a few of the horses and I liked owning them myself because then we were in control of it. Um, we've attracted more owners, very lucky that way. We've got some absolutely fantastic, I mean, the investment that's gone into the yard, it's not just me that's invested, it's the owners that have really invested and, and, and bought the horses. Um, and now we've started doing, well, actually, probably again, after the Gulf Widows and one for Arthur, we've started doing these syndicates. We do eight-person syndicates and they've been exceedingly successful. Actually, Corex owned by a seven-person syndicate, but uh, it's the same same idea, and um, it's definitely the way forward. And the, the joy that they get, and the enjoyment that they have, and the and the friendship and the camaraderie that they have within their syndicate is fabulous. When you're sourcing all of these horses, and bearing in mind a lot of the horses that you've bought and tasted great success with, they're not the most expensive horses. They're, you know, they're not sales toppers. They're, in, in some cases they can be below the average price of some of those select point-to-point -point sales. What, what is the common denominator all of those horses have? What is your secret and Scoo's secret when you go to the sales? Well this is a, we probably shouldn't let my bank manager know this, but when we go to the sales we buy the horses and then I sell them. So I go there, I put my heart and soul, Scoo puts his heart and soul, we've got a man called Paul McIver that does our form and we all go there as a team and we buy the horses that we want. We buy the horses for us. We don't buy them at a value. We do value them, and then we, and if that value's way off, we leave them. But we're, we're very strict. We do everything to a very rigid pattern. So I have to like it, Skew has to like it, and Paul has to like the form. And now Michael has to like it, because he's on, on board as well. And we, we buy the horses that we like, and then we sell them. So it's quite, you know, we're taking a risk. It's not like an agent saying, oh yeah, go, on, go and buy that one. That's a good one. That's what it's worth. You pay your money. I'm having to pay or you know be there ready to pay the money if I can't sell it. And that sort of gives you a, 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 I guess a sort of a, a sense of keenness that you, you get it right because it actually really does matter. Well it does matter because if I sell you a horse and it doesn't and it's the wrong horse it's my fault. If it's an agent that's told you to do it the agent just blames me says that you can't train it. So everything that we do we have to be answerable to. 
and it, it just makes you, it, it keeps you pretty focused, make sure that you don't make many mistakes. I don't want to make mistakes. When you get the horses back here, Lucinda, you, I wasn't aware before I came here, you're, you, you've essentially got two yards up here in, in Ken Ross. Um, what's the programme for, for horses when they, when they first arrive here? Wh which yard are they going to end up in? We start them off at the farm, um, get to know them there. We, we do a lot of work up and you know, around the fields, up and down the hills. Um, you get to know the personality a bit, you get to see how sound they are. We've got a water treadmill there so we can um, assess them. We've got a very good girl that actually works for us that does all the massage, so we assess them a bit there. And then they'll come here to the main yard, and this is quite a stiff gallop. Um, it's a uh, thousand meters, um, it's, it's stiff. And uh, if they can get up there three and four times, a couple of times a week, then we know that they're fit. Um, then they go back to the farm and have a bit of a jolly up before they go racing. Stable jockey here to Lucinda Russell is Derek Fox, who has been aboard most of the trainers' big winners. Grade one successes coming courtesy of a Hoy Senor and Apple's Way. And of course, Corrick Rambler, twice a winner at the Cheltenham Festival and also the winner of the 2023 Randox Grand National. You know, just starting off with, um, you know, just with small ponies at, at the house really and, and then progressing on through the pony race and, 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 and no, it's, it's hard to believe the, the position I've uh, to be in here working for Lucinda and Scoo, so it's brilliant. How, how did you get started with Lucinda and Scoo? Um, so so I, I, I'd ridden out here a few times uh, when we used to bring the Irish horses over to run a part in the summer and uh, so that, that, that's really how I got to know the place and then I wanted to move from Ireland over to this side of the water and uh, I just thought this was a good year to this is where I decided to I asked It was very you new people for a start anyway, yeah, like yeah. coming to work for some, some old friends. Yeah, maybe. yeah, that's it. So I, I was familiar with the yard and, and I uh, just rang Lucinda one day and asked her for a job and that was, that was it really. He's a remarkably level-headed, clear-thinking person. He's brilliant in a race. The man that you want on your side if you're going to war. I mean, he really is. He's, he's fantastic. He's very good with the horse at home, a superman to school. And he deserves everything he gets. And you know, he's, he's a really top class jockey. He's taken it all, hasn't changed him. He's a very, very good boy. In a nutshell, what would you say you've learned from, from working with Scoo, with, with Peter himself? Obviously, multiple champion jockey. I mean, he, you must have picked up a tip or two along yeah, the way. Yeah, listen, it, 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 it's so difficult to try and pick out what, 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 what he's taught me. He, he, he speaks to me every day since I landed here ten years ago. He's, he's, it's, it's just an ongoing thing with, with Skew that, that um, you know, he's, he's always. It's not that he, you know, ever one-off uh, thing that he would say, but he, you know, it's just always going over the races over the years, and 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 you know, I think just, you know, you're just always learning off him really. So so that, so so that that that's it really. There's a bit of symmetry as well with, with the two big staying chasers in the yard at the moment. Scoo looks after Carrick Rambler a lot. He pretty much rides him almost every day. And in the meantime, you look after a hoist to Nuren. We spoke to Scoo earlier and he, he was quick to give you a lot of credit for, for the success with a, a hoist to Nuren. What, what kind of a character is a hoy? Oh, he, he, he's, a, he's a wonderful horse. Um, he, he, I always look forward to riding him out every day. He, 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 he's just a very forward going horse in general. Everything he does, he, he, he does it with uh, you know, purpose and, and authority. So uh, you're always really keep, keeping him settled, is, 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 especially as a younger horse when he was over hurdles. You really had to make sure and try and keep him settled up the gallops. He wouldn't be killing himself, he wouldn't be doing too much every day. But um, no, it's a, it's a pleasure to, 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 to look after him. and. Uh, you know, it's, 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 with all this, the quality of horse we have at the minute, it, it's brilliant. He's a grade one winner over fences. He's got some very big wins already on his dance card. But do you get the sense that there's a bit of unfinished business with, with say, the Cheltenham Gold Cup? You, you were going well when you departed last year at the sixth or seventh fence. Oh, that's uh, I, I try not to look, you know, in, you know, at any one given race. But he's in good, he's in good order now, and. Uh, you know, I think I t as far as I know, he's going to Newbury. So, uh, looking forward to that, and you, you know, really, you just take one race at a time. Really, Hoy comes back to his best. He, Newbury's ideal for him. Um, there was various reasons he didn't run to his very best the other day. I think he, even with a big weight, he's a big horse. He can stand. He, he, he should be very competitive. 
Um, I haven't really studied if there's some outstanding novice, which usually a novice wins it coming through. So he will go for that. Uh, nothing really much for him over Christmas, so uh, he'll probably then go to the Cotswold Chase and then Ain uh, Cheltenham, Aintree, maybe Punchestown. I don't know. See how we get on. A house in Europe is aimed for the Gold Cup, and I see that he's actually lengthened in price, but it makes no difference. Um, so he's he's going for the Gold Cup. Grand Ox Grand National winner Corrick Rambler is owned by the Rambler Syndicate, a seven strong member team, which includes Cameron Sword, who at just 21 years of age is surely one of the youngest joint owners of a Grand National winner in history. I just feel very lucky. Um, and the whole story along has been lucky. He was the only horse for sale in the yard when I came up, so I literally couldn't have gone wrong. Um, Lucinda said, look, we can expect him to run at Perth, Kelso, Musselburgh, um, and then he's gone on to do what he's done. So, yeah, I think we all just feel kind of very lucky to, to be mixing with the best, I guess. He cost £17,000 at the sales. It's price of a new car. It's not small money, but relative to what some of these horses can cost, it, he was quite modestly, you know, it was, he was very well bought. Yeah, and I think that's that's the real brilliance with national hunt racing is that you can buy these cheaper horses and still compete at the top level and i think that's it's one of those stories that i think was good for the sport because it shows that you don't need to spend millions on a horse to, to win at these big festivals and um, we all paid anywhere from kind of three to four grand to buy in and um, so i think it, it shows that you don't always have to go to the top level of the sport and look yes we got lucky it's a bit of a once in a lifetime kind of story but at the same time, there's plenty of horses that haven't cost that much that have gone on to do great things. And yeah, Lucinda's got horses in the yard right now that have cost 30, 40, that have run at Cheltenham and, and won big races. So. Take me back to the Grand National in April. Um, what can you recall from, from the entire day? Yeah, I think going into, I think we had, we thought we might have had a bit of a chance, but I think hit with Corrette being a, come, he comes from the back a lot. Uh, so we all we knew we needed a bit, a little bit of luck. If, if something fell in front and brought us down, then kind of tough luck. So, no, we we thought we needed a bit of luck. We knew he'd probably we knew he'd stay the trip. And again, it's just whether he takes to those fences. So Lucinda built a national fence at home, but you never really know until until the actual get into the race. So of course, and you had the right man on his back as yeah. well in Derek Fox. I mean, there's probably no better person to hunt a horse around and smuggle a horse into a race. Yeah, he's fantastic. I mean, Derek's a, a brilliant jockey, he works so hard. Um, and I think for all of us, it was as much of a brilliant occasion for us, it was Derek got his recognition, the yard got the recognition. And so yeah, I think for, for everyone, we were all just happy because everyone got, got their bit of the glory. To me, it's massive. You know, you, 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 you're riding races every day of the week and, and you realise how hard it is to win any race. And uh, you know, so you never take for granted how hard it is to prepare a horse and get a horse ready for a race like the Grand National and then to go and win it. So, you know, I'm definitely well aware of uh, both times of, um, you know, how, how difficult it is and how much you need to go right for you throughout the season and on the day and everything. So, uh, no, I feel very, very lucky the, the, the way it's all worked out. Correct. We're going to give him a little bit of a test to see if he's up to Gold Cup standard, see if he's up to sort of um, uh, that sort of, um, you know, rather than being in a handicap, being in a conditions chase. Um, and we'll see after Haydock in the Betfair chase where he goes after that. He's quite remarkable to be unbeaten at Aintree and Cheltenham. He's, he's the right kind of horse to be sort of experimenting to see whether he is Gold Cup class for sure. Yeah, and I think, you know, okay, people might say, well, why, you know, why can't you tell at home? But you can't tell with him. You know, he's always, even in his races, he, he always just does enough. I mean, he could, you always, you always think that he's got a little bit more under his sleeve, you know, that not many horses that can, <laughs> can win the Grand National and as they cross the line, prick their ears and look at the camera. I mean, he, he just did that. He's just remarkable. And again, he doesn't like Kempton. He's not quick enough for Kempton. So if he was placed in the Betfair chase... Um, you might have a Cheltenham Gold Cup horse on your hands. Well, yeah, the alteration of the numbers in the Grand National has made me think uh, I wasn't enamoured with the idea of going back to Aintree, but uh, I am much more so now, it's down to 34 runners. 
Sulika Varma, the clerk of the course at Aintree. Her career in racing actually began here at Alari House as part of the Lucinda Russell racing team and she derived great pleasure from the success of Cora Grambler in the 2023 renewal of the Randox Grand National. It was, um, it was very special for me to see friends winning Grand National and to winning it a second time as well. Um, in just six years? In ju yeah, it was, was just remarkable. So it was, it was a very special day, I say a challenging day, but in the end a very special day. From a personal point of view, it must be great job satisfaction. You know, you're, you, you're clerk of the course at Aintree, it's, it's all in your watch. It, it, it's, um, there haven't, you know, in the history of the race, there haven't been too many clerks at the course. I mean, you, you're one of them who's, who's kind of presided over a Grand National. I mean, how does that make you feel? I, I look, it's the ultimate in my career. Um, it was something when I started as a clerk 13 years ago, I wasn't sure I would ever achieve. And, and when I was offered the job, it was fantastic. Um, Covid intervened when I first started, so that was a bit of a, a stop start. But um, you know, I've done done three Grand Nationals now, and every single one's had an amazing story and, and has been been great fun, really. Asking you which has been your favourite national so far, is that, would that be like asking somebody <laughs> who their favourite child is? Or, or, or does, or does Lucinda stand out for for more personal reasons than for, the others? From a personal point of view, yes. But I always firmly believe that whoever wins a Grand National. There's always an amazing story. Um, you know, I just, I just think it's such a special race that, that whoever the winner is, there's a great story to tell. And, and we've seen that every year, really. Do you, you think those, that six less horses could make, yeah, could make I, a bit of a Yeah, it's dip? funny. So I'm going to make a statement. I wish they'd made it 30. I think it'll still be a very, very, is, the national will remain as long as they jump beaches and the green fences. Um, look, it has evolved. My father rode round when it was, you know, a severe test. Uh, the fact that they've altered beaches um, means that they're much more bunched together. In my day, it was a rush to the outside, so you couldn't. There was more lining up down the outside <laughs> yeah. than the inner, so you didn't have to jump the beaches on the inside. So you know, the nature of the race has, has changed. I think as long as we, you know, and, and I understand we need to make it as safe as possible. I just think if we knocked it to 30, we would, you know, we would have a very high quality steeplechase over uh, the green fences and that's what's important. And then, the, you know, the Welsh National, Scottish National, Irish National stand out for those, um, you know, long distance staying chases. How are things shaping up at Aintree for the, for the season ahead? Um, we're in really good shape, yeah. We've, uh, we've already had our old drone fixture. I'm very, very pleased with field sizes there. I'm coming up to Grand Sefton Day now, uh, Beecher Chase, and then our new Boxing Day fixtures. So it's, they, come, they come at us quite fast this time of year, but we love it. What was the sort of rationale or the idea behind Aintree racing on Boxing Day? The, the thoughts behind racing on Boxing Day was really that we, we have a captive audience. We have Liverpool on our doorstep and we have a lot of local following. Um, and we just felt that it would be a great day for people to over the festive period to come and come and join us at Aintree. Um, we've, we've gone hard on the race program. There's over over a quarter of a million pounds there in prize money. Um, we've obviously got what was the the Tolworth hurdle, now known as the Formby Novices Hurdle Grade One, um, as as the feature on the card. It's it's just shaping up to be a really great day. And that Grade One, it sort of slots in. It's a it's a good time to have a, a Grade One Novices Hurdle as well, isn't it? Yes, it sits it sits really nicely in the program. So we're we're really looking forward to seeing who who comes along for the run. Final question is probably quite a, a cheesy one, but. What's left for Lucinda Russell and, of course, Peter and Michael and Tom? I mean, what, what's left for the whole operation? You've two Grand Nationals um, in, in six years. What, what else would you like to achieve? Well, it's funny. I think sometimes people think that we've got a very laid back attitude and we are laid back. We're, we're very, you know, sanguine about some things. But the ambition is so strong. I want to win another. I want to win another national. I want to win a Gold Cup. I want to do all these things. We're not. The exciting thing is it's not just pie in the sky, you know, it's not like when you said, if you said to me when I was seven, what, what race do you want to win? I want to win the Grand National. Well, I can now, and uh, we know how to do it, and it's just about keeping that quality of horse and keeping that, um, winning the, the good races. It's, you know, I, I love winning races, love winning all the time. Um, and of course we've got ambition about numbers. 
but actually it's the standard of, of horses that we're producing and I, I love the horses that we're buying, I love the horses that we're training, that's just what I want to keep on doing.